Hi folks, and welcome to Open Analysis Live. So today we're gonna to be taking a second look at GoogKit. A while back, we did a video unpacking an earlier version of it, and it had some interesting tricks with some UDEXs and stuff like that. But it turns out that they've switched packers and they're using a different packer now. And I saw on Twitter, Greg Lee had actually pointed out that Nazi Wham, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, from CertPL had actually posted a small little tweet about how they were now doing some checks on the file name so they wouldn't actually unpack if they detected something suspicious with the file name, like if the file name had sample.exe in it or if it was like a hash or something like that. So I wanted to take a second look at the packer just to see what had changed. And it turns out they completely use a different packer now. So I wanted to update the video. So this time it's going to be a little bit quicker than our last unpacking video because I think by now you guys are pretty familiar with the techniques that we're using. So I'm going to quickly show you guys how to unpack this. It's a pretty simple key overwrite. Afterwards, I'll show you how the anti-analysis checks are actually in GooKit itself, not in the packer. So it actually does unpack even if you have a weird sample name, but then it won't run. I wanted to point this out because I think this is kind of interesting. And it's something that I see a lot with researchers who are referring to anti-VM detections or anti-analysis detections as stopping files from unpacking when really the file is actually unpacking fine, but it's not running once it's unpacked. And I think the distinction is important to make because if you are trying to analyze a sample, once you've unpacked it, you can load it in IDA and take a look at the code and identify the anti-analysis checks. However, if it's packed, you can't do that. So I just want to point that out because sometimes you will find anti-VM and anti-analysis techniques inside the packer itself, in which case it's quite a bit more difficult because you can't use these quick tricks that I'm showing you. Whereas if the anti-analysis tricks are in the payload and it's just stopping the payload from running, it doesn't really affect our analysis because we can still unpack it, load it in IDA, and then we can see the checks pretty easily. So I'll just show you guys that today. And I should also mention that we are still super, super, super busy we're probably going to be missing a few video posts. It looks like we're pretty much down to like one every two weeks now instead of one every week, but we still have a big list of content to get through. We just need to find the time to do them. Bear with us while we work on this other project. For those of you who are going to be going to Recon in Montreal, that's where I'm based. Both Sean and I will be there, so you can come say hi to us. We might be able to give you a sneak peek of this project that we've been working on if you come say hi. That's kind of what we're aiming for. So I would say until Recon at least, we are probably going to be quite busy. The video posts will be limited, but we will keep on keeping on, try and get these out. So with that, uh, let's pop over to our VM. Let's take a look at this good kit sample. So the first place to start is in hybrid analysis here, just to show you guys how I knew which packing technique they were using. If we come down here to the process tree, we can see there's only one process, there's no children, so it's not gonna be doing process injection or process hollowing. So I've shown this trick before in other videos, and all this means is that when we try and unpack this, we'll need to focus on virtual alloc and virtual protect, because it means that they are injecting code into themselves, not into a remote process. And I did cover this in a recent video. I can link to that below, and it'll just be a refresher of what I covered in that video. Only this technique is a little bit different, and I'll show you when we get into that. Let's pop over to our VM, and we'll start debugging. So for our VM today, we are using a Windows 7 32-bit version, and I've just dropped the GooKit EXE on the desktop here. And we're going to be using x64 debug here, which is x32 debug because it's on a 32-bit system. So we'll just make this a little bit bigger. Drop the exe over. Okay, so like I showed you in a recent video, when they're doing self-injection, what we want to do is we want to focus on virtual alloc and virtual protect because they're going to have to allocate some memory to put code into in order to execute it, or they're going to need to change the permissions on an existing allocated section so they can write code into it and then change it back so they can execute it. So those are the two APIs that we're going to focus on. And to hook them, we're just going to do a control G here and we're going to look for virtual alloc, virtual alloc, pop over to it. Like I showed in other videos, we want to go until we get to the return from virtual alloc. So I'll just press enter here to follow the jump, follow the jump again. And then we can see the return instruction is right here. So we're going to just right click and toggle a breakpoint on it. So again, I'm going through this a little bit fast because I covered this in a recent video, this exact same scenario, which again, I'll link in the description of the video below. But when we return from virtual alloc, the return value will be in the EAX register. And that return value will 
will be the memory address that we've allocated. So every time we hit this breakpoint, we just have to look at the EAX register and then follow that address in our dump here and watch what's written into it. That's our one trick for virtual alloc. And now we're going to do something a little bit new, which is we are going to put a breakpoint on virtual protect. And this is something new if you guys followed the last video I had on self-injection. In that video, we didn't do this. And the reason why we're doing it here is because the packer works a little bit different. Instead of allocating a section of memory, writing a PEA file into it, and then executing it, what they do is they temporarily create a buffer where they unpack the PE file, and then they take a section of it and overwrite a section of the existing PE file in memory. So the, the PE file that we've just loaded here. And those of you familiar with the UPX packing from those old school, like how to unpack tutorials, the UPX actually does the same thing. What we're gonna do is we are going to put a breakpoint on virtual protect, and we're gonna halt our execution on virtual protect, and we're gonna try and see if that unpacked payload is existing in memory somewhere in a buffer so we can copy it out. If we didn't do that, what we could do is we could use that UPX style unpacking approach where you actually dump the PE file after it's been overwritten and you find the new entry point. But I walked through this once before uh, the video and we don't have to do that because they actually have the whole PE file sitting in a buffer and we can dump that out. And if you're wondering like, how did I know to do that the first time? I actually just looked. So I actually, I'll, I'll show you guys when we get to that. There's no magic in it. I just stepped through the same way that you'll see me doing it here. And then I took a look in the memory sections to see if there was a PE file hanging out. So I'll show you that in a second. So let's set our breakpoint on virtual protect here. So we'll control G, virtual protect, jump to that, right click, add a breakpoint. Okay, and now we're ready to run. So we run, first thing we do is hit the entry breakpoint, which is always set with X6040 bug. So we'll keep running. So now we hit our return breakpoint from virtual alloc, which means that the EAX register has a, a newly allocated memory section in it. So we'll just right click and follow in our dump here, follow in dump one. And you can see there's nothing written into it yet. So let's continue on. And uh, so they've written some code into it and we've hit another virtual alloc return. So there's a new uh, memory address in here that we wanna right click and follow in dump two. And we can look at what was written into this first allocated virtual memory. So it looks like not too much interesting here, but I do see at the bottom, I see some API names. So perhaps this is a stage where they're writing some shell code in, just gonna do some unpacking. I'm not really sure and I'm not too interested either. I'm gonna just continue on. So here we have our new section that we're watching and uh, we'll continue debugging. Okay, so we've hit virtual alloc again. And so we have a new section that we need to follow in our dump, follow in dump three. And uh, in dump two, what was written in there kind of looks like what was written into dump one. It's like the same. So if you see between the two dumps, they've written this, what looks like with the little API calls, what looks like another stage in the unpacking. Again, no PE file. So we're just gonna continue debugging. And this is our new section that was just allocated. So let's keep an eye on that. So we'll keep running here. And now we hit our entry point for virtual protect. And what do we have in our memory segment? MZ, there's the PE file, DOS string, everything in here. Looks like the section table up here, a bunch of code. So looks like we got lucky. There, it looks like there's a full PE file sitting in the memory here. So let's dump that out and we will take a look at it in IDA. So to dump it out, we have to just follow it in memory. And then we want to just right click and dump memory to file. And we'll dump it to the desktop here. Okay, so with that, let's pop over to our other VM. I will copy this over and we'll take a look at it in IDA and see if we can figure out whether this is good kit and where those anti-analysis detections are. So here we've popped over to our VM with Ida and we're loading up the file so we can take a look at it. So it looks like it's finished here. Now what we wanna do is we wanna take a look and see if we can find these anti-analysis checks and figure out why Naziwam was saying that it wasn't running. So to make things go faster, I'm going to actually use the hex raise decompiler. And I've mentioned this before. I know that it's not available to everyone, especially because it's so expensive, but it does speed things up quite a bit when you're trying to do a high level overview of the code to try and identify something. So what we're going to do is we'll just do an F5 
and take a look at the entry point here. So I'm scrolling down and we can already see some interesting stuff here. Uh, it looks like they're using stack strings and it looks like they're probably encrypted here. Yeah, there's maybe the key is six bytes and then the rest of it is the string, Yeah, which is maybe 12 bytes, yeah. So it looks like they're doing a simple XOR with a key and a string, all of it pushed onto the stack here. And that's how they're obfuscating their strings. I'm not going to go into detail about how to deobfuscate these. It's pretty simple to write a single XOR <laughs> loop and we don't I don't think we really need the stack strings what we need to do is find where they're exiting so I want to see where they would be exiting program and what conditions lead up to that so I, it's actually right here in main we can see there's an exit process here there's an if statement that checks a couple returns from some functions so if this one is null it gets in here if this one is true and if this one is true, or if this one is true, sorry, then we pop in here and we exit the process. So we wanna figure out what these things are here. So I'm gonna just name them quickly. And for name, exit if false, exit if true one, and exit if true two. Okay, so we can change these names later on. These are just to keep track of what's going on. And we can see there's one argument being passed here, this D word. So let's see if we can figure out where that's coming from first, and we'll, then we'll jump into these functions. Okay, so it looks like they assign a variable to it here. So they're doing a git module file name, which means get the name of the file on disk that is responsible for running this process. So that would be the file name, basically, and they're storing it in this D word. So let's just name that as pointer to uh, module file name. There we go. Okay, let's pop into this one first, actually. I may as well take a look at this function first. We know that this is name arg file name. Uh, let's see what they're doing here. So we're passing that file name into path find file name to grab the path for it. And then we put it into this variable. So let's name that our file name path. And then, and then we pass it into this function here with a negative one. So this is the name arg file name and what do we do to it we get the wide string length then we do a wide to multibyte so we turn into a multibyte string and what else do we do here turn into a wide string i think that's probably the output there and this is that negative one that they passed in so let's pop over here so we'll name this arg file name again, only it's wide, multi-byte, multi-byte file name. Uh, what are we doing here? Grabbing the string length. That looks like character. Oh, maybe they're splitting off the file name from it. Yep, going backwards until they hit the first slash. So this is grabbing the name, get last str before char. Okay, so what they're doing here is they're grabbing the last string before the final char value here. So what they're doing is they're actually getting the file name from the path. So the path is gonna have a bunch of slashes in it and all they're doing is they're just grabbing the string from the last, from after the last slash. So that's what they're doing here. And grabbing the length and then they're actually copying the string over, I believe, yes. And then they send it to whatever this function is here. What are they doing here? Uh, they're making it uh, uppercase, so uh, if you guys know your ASCII alphabet here, so check in if it's in the lowercase alphabet, and then they minus 32 from it. So if you guys remember ASCII, if you minus 32 from a lowercase, it becomes uppercase. So this is name to uppercase, upper, and we'll go back, go back here. So they're making it, I'll wrap this up, stir to upper, wrap. And then we'll go up the chain again. And so they've made it uppercase and they send it to this function here. And <laughs> so I've actually looked at other samples of GoodKit and this, this is a CRC32 constant. So I'll just show you that real quick here. Just open up our web browser, paste this in and search for it. You can see that if we go to wiki, and you can see that this is a constant from for CRC32. So I actually knew that because I looked at other samples of GoodKit. What they're doing here is, if we pop back to our VM, is they're actually transforming the file name into uppercase, and then they're doing a CRC32 checksum of that. This is a little bit 
interesting because this CRC32 checksum I've seen referred to as CRC32B. It's not the standard CRC32 checksum that's standard in most tools. I'm not sure if it's actually CRC32B. Really what it seems like is CRC32 with an inverted result. That's, that's what it looks like to me at least. And I'd actually been discussing this exact algorithm with Remrum from Twitter, and I'll link to his blog post in the description of the video below because he actually re-implemented this algorithm and he has a nice script for brute forcing the CRC hashes. So definitely check that out, which is why I was able to just kind of immediately see what this is. So I'm just gonna name this CRC32 custom. We'll pop back here. And so what they're doing here in this whole function is they are name, file name, upper CRC32, right? So all they're doing is they're taking that file name, they're converting it to uppercase, and then they're taking a CRC32 hash of that. So let's pop back and see how it's actually used here. So this is actually just a wrapper for that. So we'll just say wrapper and we'll pop back again. And so now what they do is they grab that CRC32 hash and they compare it against these hashes in this list. So you can see here, they loop through this list of hashes. Here, I'll just convert them to hex so you guys can see it's a little bit easier. So they loop through these hashes here and for each hash, they compare it with, I'll just name that var file CRC32. So they loop through these hashes here in a for loop and for each hash, they compare it with the CRC32 of the file. And if one of them matches, they return true. And if none of them match, they return false. So we kind of want to figure out what these CRC32 hashes are. And like I was saying before, Remrum has this brute forcing code, which will actually brute force these hashes. So I was actually getting ready to brute force these hashes. And then I figured, well, why not just Google for them? See if somebody has already done it for me. And it turned out that someone from last line had posted a blog blog post where they'd actually brute force the hashes. So I'll just show you guys quickly. I'll link to their blog post below as well. But what you can see here is you can see that these file names are actually sample.exe, malware.exe, test, blah, blah, blah. So things that you would expect researchers or analysts to be renaming the file as when they're analyzing it. It looks like GooKit actually checks the file name to see if it matches any of these. And if it matches, then it stops execution. So that's the analysis trick number one. It's the first one that we see. And again, it's not in the packer. So this is GooKit's already unpacked. This analysis trick is in GooKit itself. And that's kind of what I just wanted to show in the video was that these tricks exist exist in GooKit, which you can analyze statically in IDA. It's not that hard because you've already unpacked it. They're not in the packer. So let's hop back here and we'll see what the other tricks are. So uh, we know that this is, we'll rename this function as file name check. And we can also see this is what Nazi Wen was talking about. The file name here is also checked to see whether the length is greater than 20 hex, which is 32. So if there are more than 32 bytes in the file name, it will also return true, which will kill the execution of the program. This is the file name check. So you can see that if the file name was a anything from an MD5 hash all the way up to a SHA-256, it would actually be more than 32 characters. So this check would be hit and they would stop execution of the process. There we have it, the file name checks here, quickly analyzed. I know I went through that very quickly, but again, really what I wanted to show here was how you can still unpack the file. It's not stopping it from being unpacked. Once it's already unpacked, then the payload itself is what's checking for analysis and stopping execution. So I'll leave the rest of this for you guys to analyze yourselves. There are two more checks here. There's one check here, which if it turns out to be true, then we exit. And there's one get out of jail free check. So it looks like if this check is true, then we skip these other two checks and we don't exit. So maybe this is like a flag or something that you can set to avoid the checks. So I'll leave it up to you guys to figure out what exit of false and exit of true one are. So leave a comment below if you analyze it and figure out what they do. I'm interested to hear how many of you figure out what they are, especially the uh, check of false. I think it's kind of cool. So definitely something to look at. And I will link to the unpacked sample below so you can download it and try it in IDA if you want to. I'll also link the packed sample below for you guys to try unpacking using the same techniques that I showed you. I, I think this is a really good sample to start to learn with because it's pretty straightforward and, and you get a feel for for what to hook with virtual alloc. I think it's a good practice sample. So with that, we'll wrap it up. I'll leave a comment if you have any questions about what I showed you guys here today, or if you have any comments, feedback's always welcome. And like I said at the beginning of the video, Sean and I will be trying to get out at least one video every 
two weeks now, just because balancing this other project is pretty crazy. <laughs> we, you know, we both have full-time jobs. And then on top of that, we're trying to do these videos and then work on this other project. But stay tuned. We will be giving you a little sneak peeks of what's going on with that once we get a little bit further on. So with that, if you are not subscribed, remember to subscribe down below. One new video every two weeks. Hopefully we can keep this up till next week or the week after. Keep exposing the mechanics behind the malware and stay curious.